Hello. Um, today's video is very personal to me. It's going to be uh, very hard to do this one. Um, I did write some notes. I know I said that normally I don't write any kind of script or notes or anything. I just like to do it, you know, off the cuff, totally spontaneously and, you know, as personal as possible. So, you know, you'll see the real me, the mistakes, the whatever. But this was... It's so personal, I needed to make some notes. This is about Sheriff John Urquhart of the King County Police Department and how I believe that not only should he not be the sheriff, but he should probably be prosecuted for the way he's treated uh, the victims. as w And me, I'm a victim. Um, he's he, he has been a horrible man. He just... The way he has treated me, the way he's treated other victims. I mean, the man, all he did was use us to advance his career to become the sheriff, you know, to pretend that he cares about women, pretend that he cares about the victims. Uh, it's a lie. He doesn't care about any. He's the meanest man, one of the meanest men I've ever spoken to in that position of power that he has. So, same as Dave Reichert. Dave Reichert was one of the original men on the Green River Task Force, and now he's a, a senator or some damn thing running for re-election. He should not be in his position either. I, When I first found out that I was a victim, that Gary Ridgway was the man that raped me when I was 16, I... Uh, I contacted uh, the Green River Task Force. I contacted Dave Reichert, and that was when he was running for senator or whatever he was running for the first time. And I contacted his office several times. All I wanted to do was meet with him, to talk with him, tell him my story, maybe get some information, just, just to have him hear my story. I mean, sometimes that's... All you need is just somebody to listen and act like, the, you know, even if deep down they really don't care if they just act like they have a little compassion sometimes. But anyway, Reichert wouldn't even, wouldn't even meet with me, wouldn't even return my calls. I don't know, he's just such a big powerful man now, or, you know, he's past that in his life, so he, he doesn't want to look back. The fact of the matter is it was nothing but a stepping stone for him to advance his career, and he never gave a crap about one single one of those victims. Not one. So, anyway, um, back when I found out, when I was, like I said, uh, uh, back in 2005, somewhere around there, right after Ann Rule wrote the book called Green River Running Red, um, and it was on check stands right when it came out, I happened to be in the grocery store, and I saw the book. I picked it up, flipping through the pictures while I'm waiting to get up in the line, and I saw the picture of Gary Ridgway from 1982. I recognized him immediately. I almost fainted in the grocery line. I knew immediately who he was. So that's when I started, because, like I said, I had been living in the mountains with no power, no running water, no TV. I didn't even know they'd caught him. So right when I saw that picture, I started contacting, like I said, Sheriff Urquhart and all of them. He wasn't sheriff at the time. And they hadn't even, I think this Green River Task Force was actually still together. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't even talk to me. He didn't care, nothing. So I contacted the Seattle Times and told them my story. And they were very interested. And they assigned this reporter named Christine Claridge to write my story. And Christine, you know, was very nice at first. Uh, she was, well, through the whole thing, pretty much. She was really nice and would meet with me different places. And, and I'd tell her my story. Then we, you know, would talk on the phone every couple months. And I'd tell her more. And, you know, and she was going to put all this stuff in the story. I mean, by the, after two, it took two years of me t talking back and forth with her on the phone and she got so much information over the time period that, I mean, it was like she was going to write a book or something. She had so much information and all the things she kept promising that she was going to put into the to the Seattle Times story. Like, she was going to talk about my relationship with my mom and how, you know, it was very volatile and there was, you know, there was abuse. I mean, I love my mom now. We fix things kind of and trying to move on, but I, I can't hide, I can't cover for her. 
the fact that there was abuse and I was, you know, whatever. And so she was going to put all that in. She was going to talk about my ex-best friend, Bernadette K., now Bernadette Jones. Her married name is Bernadette Jones and how she, what a horrible person she was, what a user she was and how she... You know, she kind of put me in a lot of the situations that led to where I was. In fact, when I was raped, I was literally uh, went AWOL from Job Corps to come home for that weekend to see this guy named Sam, who I'll talk about later. When I actually tell the story of what happened that night, I'll talk more about Sam. But I went AWOL from Job Corps to come home to see Sam and Bernadette. And that's what put me where I was. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, and then she was going to, and plus Bernadette was one of the only people that I told the story to way back when. And Vonda, my girlfriend that I went to see here about a month ago, the one that I said, seeing, looking up an old friend is scary, that video. I talk about going to see this gal named Vonda. I'd actually, when I went to see her that weekend, I asked her, hey, do you remember me telling you about... When I was hitchhiking and I got picked up, and she, she immediately remembered. She remembered the story right off the bat. And I'm like, yeah, you know who that was? That was a Green River Killer. And, yeah, because she didn't know because we hadn't talked in so many years. But anyway, moving on. So the Seattle Times, you know, was working with me, and Christine Claridge was writing this big story. So she contacts John Urquhart. And, you know, because I had contacted him, he wouldn't even talk to me. He didn't care, wouldn't even listen to me, wasn't interested at all. Or Anderson, who's another one of the cops that was on the Green River Task Force, he was a fucking dick to me. In fact, all of them were. They were all dicks. And even this one woman, I can't remember her name, she was actually on it. And I thought if I contacted a woman, that at least a woman would be nice and understanding. Oh, fuck no. Women can actually be colder and meaner than men, especially when it comes to cops, because they always have this, well, they're dick wannabes, they want to be like the rest of the men, and they got to keep up, so they're just fucking way colder and meaner half the time. They don't give a shit about other women at all. So anyway, um, Christine contacts Urquhart, and she tells him that she's doing my story, and this, that, and the other, and he actually agreed to meet with us. So Christine asked me to come to Seattle because at the time I was living east of the mountains. I come over to Seattle. I, you know, and she sends this uh, camera woman named Helen with me down to the court or to the King County Police Station down there, downtown Seattle. So Helen and I, she brings her cameras, her big, you know, newspaper cameras and all this. And I had a little tape recorder with me that I put in a bag of knitting that I had brought with me. So we, <coughs> excuse me, we go into the the King County Department there, walk up to the front desk, and when you go in a, into the King County Police Station there, the main one downtown, it's in a big building, you know, one of them skyscraper buildings. I'm not a city person, so my descriptions may be retarded. Oh, that's not politically correct. I can't say retarded anymore. Anyway, then my descriptions may be of autistic. I don't know what the proper PC word is for that shit these days. Anyway, um, so you go in, and there's big glass, like, doors, and then you go, kind of go through there, and then there's, like, this counter where the reception is and whatnot. So we go in there, and I tell them, you know, that I'm, that the camera woman, Helen, and I are there to meet with, uh, with Urquhart, John Urquhart. So he comes out, and he comes up to the front desk, and, you know, there's these interview rooms right there, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, maybe he'll take us into an interview room, and I can sit down and tell my story. Oh, no, no. He's like, he takes out this tiny little notepad, literally this big, this little notepad, and a pen, and he's standing there at the desk, and he's like, oh, well, go ahead, tell your story, just like that. I'm like, okay, I'm looking around, I'm like standing in a very busy area, in, just inside the lobby of the main hall, skyscraper, whatever, where people are going to elevators and going to other shops, and you know, hundreds of people walking by, and the doors to the are right open, and the reception counter where I'm standing is less than 10 feet away from all this activity, 
And I'm nervous as hell already. This is a very emotional thing. And I'm looking around and I'm like, okay. All right. So I start telling my story. I'm like, well, you know, I had gone AWOL from, you know, Job Corps and I came home and I was going to see the, my boyfriend, Sam, and uh, I was hitchhiking. And he's like, oh, let me stop you right there. You were hitchhiking? I mean, the way he said it, I can't even really do it. He's like, you were hitchhiking? Like, looked down his nose at me like, oh, well, you know, hitchhiking, so whatever happened to you, you deserve it, you know. Just, I mean, he crunched up his nose and everything. Oh, you were hitchhiking? And I'm like, yeah, so I go on, and I'm like, and this car pulled over and picked me up, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to stop you right there. I don't know what you think I'm going to do with this once you leave, but all I'm going to do is wad it up and throw it in the garbage once you walk out the door. Word for word, that's exactly what he said to me. I have it on tape. Well, I did. I gave the tape to Christine Claridge, who promised she would put it in the story. She didn't. Anyway, Helen, the camera woman, we turned around and we left and we walk out front. And I literally had to stop outside the doors because I was in tears by then. I was just bawling. It was just, it really, really hurt. And uh, anyway, I turn around and I look at Helen and she's freaking tears just pouring down her face too. I mean, I could tell it really affected her emotionally. She couldn't even hardly talk. She was so upset at what Urquhart had done to us. I mean, he, he may as well have spit on me. He may as well have spit on me. Because it was almost like being victimized again, you know. What I went through, what I've gone through with the King County Police was almost as bad, if not as bad as what happened to me in the first place. I feel that they victimized me all over again. Um, they spit on me. They made me feel like trash. I mean, yeah. So, anyway, he said that he was just going to throw the report away once I left. So, later, when I, I, you know, Christine apparently had called him back. And when I was talking to Christine Claridge about what had happened later, she said that when she talked to Urquhart, he told her that, oh, well, you know, Jennifer, we, we, we can't disprove her story. That's right. That's why he agreed to meet with me in the first place, because when Christine originally contacted John Urquhart, he told her that, because they did listen to a lot of my story, because I guess apparently what they did, I didn't know this, but thousands of people came out of the woodwork claiming to be victims of the Green River Killer, which I find really strange. What kind of person would just make up a story like that? What kind of person would just want to, really, you want that kind of attention? I'm doing this because I want to help other women, because I want to tell my story, because I think it will help me heal, because then I can move on to maybe become a victim's advocate myself later or something. Not because I enjoy the attention, because believe me, it has not been good. <laughs> wow. So anyway, I guess the way that they do things is by disproving people's story. And according to Urquhart, he told Christine Claridge in the Seattle Times that my story is the only one they cannot disprove. That during the month of December uh, 1979, when I said he picked me up hitchhiking, apparently they had no idea where he was for that entire month. That he had taken the month off from Kenworth and they don't know where he was. So my story was the only one that they cannot prove discredit but at the same time he wouldn't list me as a, a victim because or they didn't really take my story as being an official story because I said that he picked me up in a car he was driving a big four-door car and according to Urquhart he had a truck you know it's like the man was out and about for almost 20 years or see 79 when he picked me up they caught him after 2000 what was it 2001 so 22, 23 years he was running around. You don't think he ever had a different vehicle? Really? Not to mention the fact that there was another man in the vehicle with us. That Yeah, I'll tell all that story another time. But yeah, he. and then he told Christine 
that mine was the only story they couldn't disprove, and that's why he agreed to meet with me. So I go down with the camera woman, blah, blah, blah. I says he's going to throw away my report. We leave, blah, blah, blah. Later, Christine calls him and asks him why he did that after he had agreed to meet with us. And he tells Christine, well, she sued us before, and we don't like her, so we're not going to listen to her. So apparently, because I sued the King County Police back in 1998 for because uh, they beat the shit out of me and arrested me and did all this crap to me, and when the, after I went to the emergency room because they beat me up, fucked up my neck and my back and everything else, the doctor gave me a neck brace, all this other shit, and medicine, and when we were leaving the emergency room, the cop took my neck brace off and took the medication and threw it in the garbage and said, you won't be needing this where you're going, and he did it right in front of the fucking doctor. So that's what I ended up winning my lawsuit for. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even let me, you know... Uh, it couldn't even be because the cop beat the fucking shit out of me. And that cop who beat the shit out of me ended up, his brother was the captain of the police in Stevens County after I won my lawsuit and moved there. Yeah, all those different stories. <sighs> so, back to this one. So, uh, give me a minute. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I think I need to take a bonk hit. I'm starting to, yeah. Ew. Yucky. Time to clean the bomb. Okay. Anyway. <coughs> so he tells Christine that he won't listen to me because I had sued them before and they didn't like me. But the thing is, is that, you know, he picked me up hitchhiking when, before he started raping. And Urquhart, in his wisdom actually told me one time that they didn't think that he was a rapist, that he had ever raped. I, I can't believe that he would say such a, a thing. I mean, really? Does he think that Ridgeway just woke up one day and says, oh, I'm just going to go out and start killing women? And, and no, they usually do shit that leads up to it. I mean, Urquhart is a fucking moron. The man, like I said, all he did was use us to enhance his career. He's never cared about the victims. He's never cared about the truth. Any of it. You would think at the very least that the profilers would want to talk to me so that they would want to, you know, piece it all together. No. Hey, did he start torturing women, uh, dogs and cats? Did he start by raping someone and then, you know, got brave and moved on, which is what I think, you know. But no, they don't even care. They don't even care. They don't want to hear the stories. They don't want... They, What's the use of a profiler, really? I think it's just a person that they made up for CSI. It's just a position they made up to make the show CSI popular. I don't think it's a real thing. Um, so anyway, yeah, um, I've had to live with the guilt of not telling. Um, I, I can't talk about that right now. Um. I want to apologize to the families of all the women. Um, I can't, I can't do that right now. Um, I'm not quite ready to tell my story of what happened, so, but I am very sorry that I didn't tell. Um, I was afraid of my mom. I would have, um, Got my ass beat for hitchhiking. She wouldn't have cared about any of the rest. She would have said I deserved it. Um. Anyway, I gotta. I um. I have to move on. I can't. I can't uh, talk about that right now. Um. Yeah. I mean, most of us victims were what they called supposed prostitutes. Um. I wasn't. A prostitute but I lived in the streets like I said my mom kicked me out the first time when I was 12, 11 so I was living in the streets a lot and you gotta do what you gotta do when you're living in the streets I never had sex for money but I did to get a meal or a place to live I mean maybe if I'd been smarter I would have took money then I would have at least had some money to live on but I always had this 
what I thought was pride or whatever that kept me from crossing that line. Oh, you know, my religious background and pride, whatever. Oh, I can't take money. That would make me a prostitute. But in the end, I think I would have been smarter. I probably would have, you know, I mean, really, you just have for a meal and a place to stay. And, um, but anyway, you know, when you live in the streets, you do what you have to to survive. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you're willing. So I believe that the t type of people that Gary Ridgway preyed on, even if they were prostitutes, I don't think any of them wanted to be. Very few women are out there just because they enjoy sex so much, or it's just man's penis is just so fucking delicious that they just want to be a freaking prostitute. I I really highly doubt it. I'm sure there might be a few hose monsters out there that that are like that, but most of us, no, we had to survive. You have to do what you have to survive, and just because you say yes, doesn't mean you're willing. Not all the time. So. Um, all right, I'm going to, yeah, I'm not a throwaway person, and either we're not one single one of those uh, girls, not a one. We all deserved better. We all deserved better. We weren't throwaway people, and I think that John Urquhart owed us more. I think he owed us more. He could have, at the very least, listened to my story. I mean, you know, I understand that he's already been caught, and he's already been prosecuted, and he's in prison and all that, and with the money and budgets that it would be more important to, you know, like, you know, test old rape kits and things like that. But, I mean, they should at least take my story, at the very least, and, and list it in the public records or something, or... Maybe have a profiler spend an hour or two talking to me so they could, like, you know, put that in the computer. And, you know, if other prostitutes, uh, so-called whatever people, you know, want to, they could put their stories to that. All right, I can't even talk anymore. I'm, um, like I said, this was very hard for me to do, which is one of the reasons I haven't actually done, told the story of that night. I'm going to do that, though, real soon. I might have to get drunk. <laughs> I may have to get really good shit-faced drunk before I could do that video. Um, but uh, I am going to do a video about Christine Claridge and the Seattle Times in the next couple days. What they did to me, I mean, like I said in the beginning, she pretended to be my best friend. She treated me so good and made all these promises to me. And even when they tricked me into coming to Seattle for his 49th arraignment, they lied to me. They used me. They tricked me. They're just... I'm So I'm going to do a story about what Christine Claridge in the Seattle Times did to me. But it might be a couple of days. Thank you for listening. And if any of the families actually see this, I want to say words. I have so much that I want to say, but I can't yet. Other than I'm just so sorry. I'm so sorry for your loss. And if there's anything I can do to bring it back, I would trade myself for them in a heartbeat if I could go back. I'm so very sorry.